to bring up uh, Doctor and Doctor, who are going to talk about uh, the, the, the Jop Rocket. Yeah? Let's give these gentlemen a big round of applause. Have a good time. All right, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, as mentioned, we're going to be introducing and talking about the Jop Rocket. Uh, and so in a few minutes, you'll learn about the supremely wicked tool for Jop gadget discovery. With me is Dr. Bramwell Brizendine. He is the creator of the Jop Rocket. Uh, you'll find more information about the Jop Rocket at JopRocket.com, as well as the GitHub. And uh, I don't see it here, but it's a link later on in the slide, so we'll get to it in a moment. Uh, Bramwell's an assistant professor at Dakota State University, and um, you can see his contact information at the bottom. My name's Josh Strohshine. I'm also an assistant professor at Dakota State and was the chair for Bramwell's dissertation, which is where this work was uh, really focused and conducted under. My contact information is also at the bottom of the slide. A couple of quick acknowledgments. Uh, Austin Babcock, undergraduate research assistant at DSU as well. He's studying cyber operations and he put together the job exploit that you'll see here towards the end of our presentation. Um, he is looking for any opportunities for internship and work. So if you're looking for a, a very talented student, please feel free to contact him or reach out to Bramwell and myself and we'll, we'll be happy to put you in contact. Um, we also would like to thank Dr. Jared DeMott of EDA Labs. Um, he is a part of the dissertation committee as well as a, a well-renowned security researcher. So a big thanks to him. So what are we going to talk about today? Quick in 20 minutes, uh, we're going to spend a few moments on ROP. ROP is important to understand in order to understand JOP. Uh, we're going to get into JOP, Jump Oriented Programming. More importantly, you'll get to know the JOP Rocket a little bit better, some of the finer points of JOP exploit development, and then it'll be time to take a ride on the JOP Rocket itself. And I'm going to leave that up to Bramwell. So this begs the question, uh, did this work invent JOP? It did not. There is some references in the literature that goes back about a decade. However, it was sparse. There aren't a lot of tools or um, other frameworks that are available to help further learn, explore, or utilize JOP in your, your daily exploit endeavors. Um, so this work really endeavors to fill that gap to provide more literature. And as, in addition, it also will do this in the Windows environment. So um, again, not a lot of information there for doing JOP on Windows. Uh, what is JOP? Well, simply put, it creates a side door. If you're having trouble with your exploit chains with ROP and the ROP heuristics being detected, then JOP may allow you to bypass those mitigations and ultimately get shellcode to execute. We're not trying to oversell the JOP rocket though because JOP is just another category of code reuse attack. It is not another category of exploit. A little background, uh, you can go back to the late 90s with the return to libc, uh, ret to libc. Uh, that opened the door for ROP, return oriented programming. Um, ROP borrows little chunks of code that end in rets. And there's a couple of important concepts that come along with this. Uh, we have gadgets, which are instructions or a series of instructions that end in a ret. And then we have our chains. And those chains uh, simply are then a series of gadgets that do something practical, like call a function in the Windows API. Um, important thing to note here is that these, uh, with ROP, were really dependent upon the stack in order to control the flow, the execution of our ROP chain. That changes a little bit with, with JOP. Um, come some prevalent tools, uh, ones that would likely you have all used before, uh, would be Mona by the Coreland team and, and Peter Van Eckout, as well as the ROP gadget. Here's an example of a ROP chain generated by Mona. Uh, as you can see, the addresses that are going to be placed on the stack as part of the payload, um, those are the addresses that are going to be uh, the fetched um, after the, the gadget itself is executed and ends in a RET. So again, going back to the stack in order to control the execution, the flow of that entire chain. So jump-oriented programming, or JOP, differs uh, in that we are using jump and call instructions in order to control the flow. So JOP is really just ROP without the RETs. Uh, while the stack is not available for the control flow, it is still, it is still necessary to use the stack in order to set up and, and make calls to the Windows API. Because remember, we're focused on the Windows API here. A couple of different paradigms. We have the dispatcher gadget, the dispatch table. We'll get into more details here in just a few minutes. The JOP rocket does use both of those. That's the approach that it's taken. Um, there's also some different techniques available with JOP that you can use in your everyday ROP. So uh, a pop jump, where you pop into a register and then jump to that register in order to uh, go back to the stack, for example, uh, if you're having trouble finding uh, you know, your ROP gadgets. So you can JOP and then go back to ROP. 
So about those two paradigms that we discovered that I mentioned just previously, uh, the dispatcher gadget and the dispatch table. The, the dispatcher gadget is the instrument of change. It moves things forward and backwards in that dispatch table. It ideally should be short and sweet, and it should also be predictable. It should predictably modify the register holding the address to that dispatch table. Uh, the dispatch table then has entries that lead to the addresses of the functional gadgets, and the functional gadgets are what really um, allow us to, to, to modify registers and set up the stack in order to make our Windows API, API calls. Here is a maybe somewhat oversimplified control flow diagram. You have the dispatcher gadget, which controls flow into the dispatch table, which then dereferences and calls those different dispatch gadgets, uh, or functional gadgets, excuse me. Um, from there, instructions are executed, that'll feel a bit like ROP, uh, and then you'll jump or call back to the dispatcher gadget, and the cycle will continue to repeat until you've accomplished whatever functionality that you're out uh, to get. That's my part was brief, so uh, I'm gonna let Bramwell take it from there. Thank you, Josh. So all this kind of begs the question of why is JOP not much used? Uh, in fact, uh, in 2015, one person even claimed that JOP had never been used in the, in the wild. Of course, that was wrong. It has been, but only very, very rarely. So some of the reasons for that uh, pro lack of proper tooling, we just don't have tools to find JOP. And if you're trying to do JOP, that, that's a serious problem. JOP is also much trickier. It's less well understood, whereas with ROP, it's very well documented. Uh, great literature that exists, great tools that are available to facilitate that. There's difficulty in finding JOP gadgets. Uh, from a couple of different perspectives. First, uh, just the number of JOP gadgets relative to ROP gadgets is much, much fewer, so that makes it much more challenging to, to find the right gadgets. Uh, secondly, if you don't have a dedicated tool, then it can make it uh, difficult or even impossible to find enough uh, gadgets. And the reasons for that is op code splitting. So our, our ROP tools, our Mona, so on and so forth, will do the op code splitting. Uh, but if you try to just use general purpose reverse engineering tools, it's not going to uh, very easily or readily, readily allow you to, to do that. And so then it would be a kind of a manual process that could be tedious and time consuming, just like it would, the same would be if you tried to do it with, with ROP, if you didn't have a tool such as, as Mona. So we've got to be very grateful for, for those uh, different tools. So JOP, yes, it, it is a little bit more complex. Uh, folks still don't really know too much about it, uh, don't know how to use it, and that's, that's understandable because there's not much that's written about it. There's some that's written in the academic literature, uh, and additionally, there, I mean, if you try to search for uh, uh, articles on how to use it in Windows, you just won't find anything uh, for the most part. Uh, so that's perfectly understandable. Uh, with the job, you also have to pay attention to registers that are being used for the dispatcher gadget, for the dispatch table, and those, if you tie those registers up, then you can't use them for other purposes, so that uh, just adds to the complexity, adds to the chaos. We need the dispatcher gadget too. It's a very rare, very scarce gadget. If we can't find it, then we can't do the dispatcher gadget uh, paradigm, so that can be problematic. Of course, you can still try the pop X, jump X, uh, paradigm, and you could even temporarily do ROP and then do a little bit of JOP. That's entirely possible. So many of you are probably familiar with ROP. You may be masters of ROP. The good news is a lot of that can carry over, so uh, some of those ROP techniques will also apply to JOP as well. So at this point, we want to uh, introduce the JOP rocket, uh, honor the sacrifice that uh, ancient rocket cats made so many centuries ago to deliver their malicious, malicious payload. Uh, so a little bit of history lesson, I guess in 1300s there'd be, there were uh, so-called rocket cats that would have explosives uh, strapped to their back and they would uh, be able to uh, subdivert, subvert uh, the defenses of a well-defended castle to deliver their payload. Jop Rocket tries to do the same thing. Uh, we can get past uh, ROP heuristics. Um, so very sophisticated tool, it's a Python script, uh, has dependencies that are required, can run in a Windows environment, can, can uh, run in uh, Linux. Um, it is static analysis, uh, and the only reason I did that is simply from a programming standpoint, it made it more challenging, more difficult to, to write it rather than something that would integrate with an active process. 
You can take an executable or a PE, you can scan it, as well as all of its associated modules and DLLs. Uh, the Jop Rocket features uh, command line uh, user interface, uh, it accepts brief uh, keyboard shortcuts, uh, very easy to memorize, very easy to quickly utilize them. It also has a convenient get everything option, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit here. So some of the features uh, of the Jop Rocket, uh, tremendous flexibility in terms of how we can discover the different gadgets, um, both functional and dispatcher gadgets. So there are reasonable defaults, but if you're not finding what you want, you can enlarge, you can uh, narrow the scope. Uh, as it goes through and uh, acquires the gadget, it performs classification into dozens of categories based on the operation. For instance, is it adding, is it doing sub? and also on the registers that are affected so that you as the uh, user can be very specific and gr about you know what you uh, want, want to acquire. Also has a, an option to get everything uh, and print it as a CSV. Uh, so that can be incredibly useful if you want to gain insights into whether or not a specific binary would have enough gadgets to perhaps uh, support job. Uh, it does feature opcode splitting. Uh, the challenge with opcode splitting is if you do it from a return oriented program and you go f for the, the C3 or the red or one of the variations to disassemble backwards and enumerate everything, with ROP you're looking for the uh, opcodes for many different indirect calls or indirect jumps. So there's a lot more to, to uh, consider there. Contributions of the jock uh, rocket just from a, a standpoint of how it's uh, built and how it's put together. It does a lot of things in kind of an original unique fashion and the reason for that is just not wanting to ape or mimic the uh, contributions of others but just to try to do something uh, in my own fashion but maybe not particularly interesting in terms of how to uh, perform job. So how do we uh, utilize the job rocket? Uh, it is again a static analysis tool. Uh, we do run it from the uh, command line. Uh, it can uh, support any platform that has the necessary dependencies. Um, you know, if it, since it is targeted towards Windows, if you are doing it in a, a Linux environment, it's going to miss out on the ability to scan the uh, the modules because you know some of them simply won't be present. Um, now, how do how we do it from the command line? We can do uh, Python prog and then the the file name. If it's a local file, if we do it that way. Uh, it's just going to get the image executable. Otherwise, you want to provide the absolute path, which we can supply in an input text file. Uh, and it needs that to enum enumerate the different uh, uh, modules. So, a number of different options uh, associated keyboard shortcuts. I won't spend too much time on that. Um, and there is more as well. So, how do we use the Jop Rocket? Uh, again, lots of many, many different features, but by design, a very minimalist user interface just to make it a little easier to use, a little bit more friendly. So, the first step we want to establish the registers of interest. Are we looking at EAX? Are we looking at EBX? That's the first step. And then we establish scope. Do we want call or do we want jump? Keep in mind, if you do call, then you're adding to, to the stack and so if you're trying to load Windows APIs then that can be problematic. But you can compensate for that of course. Uh, additionally are you looking for mod at modules and DLLs which you probably are or are you just looking at the uh, image uh, executable. Once these selections have been made then we just hit G for go and it will get those gadgets. Uh, and then we go to the printing sub menu and we can print the uh, what it's found to, to files. Uh, many, many different op options based on classification, based on the operation, based on the registers that have been uh, affected. So you can be very specific, very granular. Um, and of course, if you need to, you can uh, enlarge uh, the scope or, or narrow it. And there, there are many uh, specialized uh, options that we won't discuss that can allow you to uh, kind of finagle uh, some of that. Uh, again, the option to do uh, uh, everything as a uh, CSV, just to get a, a broad overview of whether or not a uh, binary may support that. So, how do we get the uh, dispatcher gadgets? First step is to select the registers of interest, uh, and then D for dispatcher gadgets. We go and acquire those, and then we go to the print sub menu. We can print those out. Uh, if you want to use call on the dispatcher gadget, that can be problematic because it's constantly uh, interfering with the stack, but you know, it's an option. So, a couple screenshots here. Uh, very minimalist uh, UI. Uh, 
Now we're going to discuss a JOP exploit, uh, to try to get, gain a kind of an understanding of, uh, how all this comes into play. So this is a, uh, a wave reader, uh, prints out or gets some information on a wave file. We provide it with a malformed, uh, wave file. Initially we have, uh, an overflow just to set things in motion and then we set up our, uh, JOP gadgets. Uh, we set up the dispatcher gadget, we set up the dispatch table, uh, and then we do our job change. So we're going to bypass depth data execution prevention. We call virtual protect, we call write press process memory. The second one is not necessary, but we do it anyway. And then we do our NOP sled, and then our shell code, and then profit. So, some basics here uh, the register for uh, dispatcher address is EDX. And then EDI will contain the address of the dispatch table and then we serve dispatcher gadget instructions. There we're adding C or 12 at base 10 to the uh, dereferenced uh, EDI. So uh, we can see a nice little diagram of our exploit that we're about to, to do momentarily. We have the dispatcher gadget which allows us to advance forward by 12 taking us to the dispatch table uh, and then we have padding in between um, and then the functional gadgets which are similar to ROP and then it swings right on back to the dispatcher gadget that then advances uh to the next entry in the dispatch table. So setting things up here uh we have the initial overflow. We want to set up the dispatcher gadget. Uh we're doing call EDX. Um we do a little bit of exclusive OR action and we provide the two different uh values for EDX and EDI or dispatcher gadget and dispatch table and then we call EDX the dispatch uh gadget. Uh, after that we can then start crafting the function calls. To do that we move ESP to a known location. It just makes things a little bit easier. Uh then we're call it, we're calling uh the API functions. We're setting up virtual protect. We we provide the necessary parameters. That's good. And then we do write process memory. We provide those, uh, parameters. Uh, so with virtual protect, we can then make it so that, uh, memory is rewrite executable rather than just simply, uh, read write. So supplying values for those functions, we get ECX to a known value. It doesn't really matter what it is, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna modify it with exclusive OR. Then we pop a value into EAX. We do the exclusive OR on it. And then we pop another value into EAX. And now we have two values that we can push onto the, the stack. Uh, and then so we do that. Um, and then we need to compensate for, uh, ESP. Uh, we do dereference virtual, uh, protect pointer. Um, so we go ahead and, and do that and we will utilize that a little bit later on. Now, the goal here is to do purely JOP with the dispatcher gadget paradigm. And since we're doing two Windows API calls, well, uh, an API call is a function. A function ends in a ret. So that takes us out of JOP. So we do insert one ret to get us right back into JOP. Again, we have the option to call. We just need to do provide compensation by adjusting the stack. So it's not that big of a deal. Uh, getting write process memory, uh, that one is a little bit more, uh, challenging. There's not a direct pointer to it in the binary, unlike with, um, virtual protect. But with, since we've dereferenced it, we can do a little bit of finagling with, the, uh, anal by analyzing the DLL and do some hex math and, uh, then we can, uh, thereby reach that, re reach that. Uh, we can also jump to other registers if we want to shuffle around the, uh, address of the dispatch dispatcher gadget, that's not a problem. So let's go ahead and take a look at a demo. So first we want to establish the registers of entry. Uh, we go ahead and do that by typing R and then we're doing all, so that's getting all registers. Other options, but we're gonna bypass those. It goes and acquires those. We go to the print menu. Uh, then we select the registers to print, the registers affected, uh, G for all. Uh, we look at all operations and then Z, it then goes and acquires them. Uh, and then we see some gadgets that it's found. Just one random, uh, example here. We see our initial, uh, overflow. Uh, we set that up and then we set, uh, our dispatcher gadget to EDX and then our dispatch table to EDI. Uh, and then we go ahead and get, um, uh, get it going there. Now we have our, uh, the wave file, wave file that we've read into memory. We have some shell code there. Then we have the, the header, just a traditional wave header. 
Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and make our virtual, virtual protect call and this is all purely JOP. So what we want to do is we want to provide it with the necessary uh, JOP parameters. So we go ahead and do that. Let's see that in, in motion there. Okay, nice. And then after, after that, then it takes us to the dispatcher gadget. We see that add EDI uh, C. And that'll follow uh, every single um, uh, functional gadget. We get ECX to a known location just so we can do exclusive OR action on it. Then we go ahead and um, so we get the first couple of parameters for virtual protect. Uh, we do some uh, stack adjustments there. Um, then we go ahead and dereference virtual protect. Keep in mind we will be utilizing that a little bit later on. Uh, and then we go ahead and do a jump ESP which now contains virtual uh, protect. Uh, and then we have uh, values for the pop instructions uh, that will follow uh, subsequently. And this part may be a little bit tricky to understand here just uh, utilizing uh, the stack. And so um, there we go. And then we go to uh, we need to fix the registers after the call. We do our write process memory. Much of this is uh, more or less the same. We're providing parameters, uh, making stack adjustments. Uh, nothing too earth shatteringly uh, difficult. You can do a little bit of semi tricky things like if you, well I guess it's not really that tricky but if you want to use a call EDX that's fine. Just got to do a little bit of extra uh, stack adjustment which you see right there uh, in, in the next line. Uh, then we want to get to our write process memory. Remember we dereference virtual protect because virtual protect is in kernel 32 which you know ASLR that can make it um, you know unpredictable. Uh, and so we get the, get that, we add the offset for write process memory so that we can then make a call to write process memory. Uh, and then we're all set to go. We just need to provide the necessary uh, parameters for that. Uh, and then once we provide those parameters, uh, make sure that we get the stack values, then we're ready to go. We can then execute write process memory, which we're right going to do. And we got a notepad. We didn't do a calc, but we got a notepad. So, um, that's it. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, we'll be down there. You can go ahead and reach out to us. Thank you.